Welcome everybody to this edition of the Weightlifting World Podcast. Today we're joined by the strongest American weightlifter of all time. He won all nine US national championships between 1997 and 2005 and holds all three American records at super heavyweight. He won Pan American Games, placed fifth at world championships and competed at the Olympics in 2000 and 2004. Furthermore, prior to this exemplary weightlifting career, he had already won silver and bronze overall medals at IPF World Powerlifting Championships and set numerous powerlifting records. Welcome, Shane Hammond. Hi Shane, how are you? Great, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Oh well, thank you very much for, for joining us. How's your day going? Oh, it's going well so far. Good, it's, good. Uh, raining a little bit and I like rainy weather, so that works. Are you in Tulsa at the moment? That's correct. In Tulsa, excellent. I, I actually went to Oklahoma, well, it must be a good five or six years ago now, to sit my USAW um, coaching qualification. Oh, wow, so you did that in Oklahoma. Yeah, huh? in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a nice high school in Oklahoma, yeah, it was very good. All right, cool. All right, so we really, if we, we'll just start off at the beginning. Um, just, just tell us a little bit about your growing up in Oklahoma, kind of your young life and how you feel that laid the foundation for what was to come in your sporting future. Well, I grew up. My dad had a produce stand down at the at the at the farmers market in Oklahoma City, and um, so we kind of we did farm work growing up. We, you know, raised watermelons, pumpkins, that kind of stuff, and then we bought a bunch of other stuff from other people. And really, I mean, that was that was kind of my life growing up was raising produce and selling it down at our store. And um, I don't know. I just one thing it really gave me was a good hard work ethic. You know, I was raised working hard. Yeah. You know, and knowing what it took to make a dollar, that kind of thing, and and I think that really kind of helped me to be able to, you know, later in life, be able to fight for the things that I wanted so much. Was it a complete family event? You know, was everyone involved? Yeah, it was. I have two older brothers, and so we were all part of it. You know, my mom, dad, my brothers, and I, and we were yeah, we were just a family business. And we all did that, and you know, yeah, that's what we grew up doing. And, and, and in, the, in, in in your book, uh, from melons to medals, available from from good booksellers everywhere, um, you you talk about lift, you know, lifting watermelons and pumpkins that weighed up to three hundred pounds. Yeah, we we had some. We actually grew watermelons up to a hundred pounds. Yeah, we had some big ones, but pumpkins, yeah, they got up three hundred pounds. We actually had some that were five hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. At one point, we had some we had some big old pumpkins, so that was that was my first definitely heavy, you know, competition type. Yeah, I was trying to lift those pumpkins up on the back of a truck. What do you <laughs> use a five hundred pound pumpkin for? Three hundred. Ah, but up to five hundred. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. What do you use a pumpkin like that for? Is it for ultimate so, Halloween? All it's for is decoration. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. And uh, all decoration. And, and I guess when you were you were that age and you're lifting this, these kind of pumpkins up, I mean, did, were you getting a sense then that you were a lot stronger than your friends and, and, and so forth? Yeah, whenever we were out there picking these kind of things, I was the only one that could lift them up on the truck, and so everybody did talk about how strong I was. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was it kind of started at that time. Everybody was like, man, you're strong. So, yeah, I, I was strong from a pretty young age. Yeah. Um, and, and also in, in, in the book... Um, you know, you, you talk about some of the other sports that you that you played as a kid. You you you, you played a bit of soccer. Um, you, you, obviously, you played a little bit of American football, and also you you were very passionate about golf, and I believe that carries on today. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, I played soccer from for quite a few years growing up, and you know, from from I guess age seven to like age thirteen, yeah, something like that. I played soccer, and I just I really loved it. It was a good sport, and then I started getting bigger. So when I got in high school, in ninth grade, I tried football out and I played a couple of years of American football and you know high school and I liked it, but I didn't really love that sport. Did Did you like and, soccer? Soccer was it? Is it, is it something you kind of continued to follow? Or, um, you know, I I once I got out of it, I wasn't that involved with it anymore. Yeah. So I still love I love it. I love watching it now, and I've got a daughter. That, you know, that's three years old. She plays. Oh, really? She's already playing soccer. I think it's a, definitely a great sport to start people in. Yeah. And you know, start kids in and, you know, running and learning to kick and that kind of stuff. So yeah. we've got her playing and she loves it. Well, I have a three-year-old son as well and he actually, he lifts already. 
Mm, he's okay. already learning the, the, the kind of the, the weightlifting techniques, but he does other stuff too. He's quite 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 um, a broader array of sports that he's doing, um, and, yeah. and, and and golf as well. Obviously, you're a very very passionate golfer. I do love golfing. Yeah, that's something that I don't get to do quite as much as I used to. But what I did was I really got into golfing when I was lifting. I yeah. started when I was 21. First time I golfed and. All through my Olympic lifting career, wow. I really used it as cross training. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the one thing I really liked about it was in golf, to get the ball right, you have to, you know, you have to rely on your technique and timing and everything. It really yeah. was a lot like the Olympic lift. So sure. I just used it as cross training. Yeah. Great for, yeah. Re- great for relaxation and focus as well. If you're playing yeah, well. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if you're playing badly. <laughs> You know, golf, you go out there and you have to do it for four hours. You know, I have to do it for a few seconds on the platform. Yeah. Sure, sure. And you, <laughs> yeah. you, you also you also state in the book that the first time that you ever really went into a gym, I think you said in, in high school at, at 14 years of age, that you um, you, you squatted and you lifted 500 pounds um, the first ever time you, 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 that you did a squat. And then only a couple of years later, with kind of minimal ad hoc training, you, you squatted 600 pounds for a triple. I mean, that's, that's kind of an, an incredible start point for any strength athlete. Yeah, that was it. Was the first time I really lifted, and uh, we were just we were in there training for off season football, and you know we were, they decided they wanted us to max out on the squat, so we just started squatting, and I just kept going, and ended up ended up doing five hundred pounds, and uh, yeah, I mean that you know that was at that point I kind of knew I was you know pretty strong at that point. Sure. I was like, okay, maybe this is something I'm good at. I mean, this is, I think this is, this is something that you do here sort of semi-regularly from, from the strongest people in the world. Uh, I, I was talking to uh, one of our, um, the best strongmen competitors in Britain, uh, a man called Terry Hollands, and he was, was telling me that the first time he ever went into the gym and deadlifted, he deadlifted 290 kilos. <laughs> so it's quite, wow. a common, quite a common thing for the strongest yeah, I people. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, with, with any of the, of the strength sports, you can, I mean, I mean, so much of it comes down to natural ability. Yeah. It really does. I mean, everybody knows that. You can train and train and train, and some people just aren't going to make it. Yeah. You know, no matter how hard you train. So you do have to have a good, you know, uh, physically, you got to be able to do it first. Yes, exactly. And, and, then you, and then you train hard, and then you can do well. If, you, if you've already got the, the the base strength and you respond well to training, that's an incredible kind of genetic package. Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. When you were in high school and you did this max squat session, surely your the high school football coach just looked at you and said, "Oh my God, we, we we've got to steal him. We've got to keep him here." He must have been so impressed. <laughs> well, they. I mean, they wanted me to play football, but I but I started falling in love with lifting. Yeah, and I wanted to lift, and I remember at one point. I mean, when I was my, when I was a sophomore, when I was in tenth grade, um, I I told my football coach, "I'm going to just start. I'm not, I don't want to play football anymore. I want to go start lifting. I'm going to go to the gym after school." And uh, he called me in his office, and he told me, "Here's one thing he told me. He said." Go ahead and go do what you want, but you're never going to amount to anything with some weight. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, oh yeah. He said, you can play football in front of millions of people, or you can lift weights in front of like ten people. You're never going to amount to anything. Get out of my office. That's what he told me. Wow. And I said, all right, we'll see what happens. <laughs> was that was that quite, was, was that was that something you kept with you for motivation? No, I didn't care. I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. So I do mean. You- do you believe Whatever. that you ha- had the potential to, to to perhaps go on and play collegiate and perhaps professional fo- American football? You know, I mean, I'm five foot nine. Yeah. You know, you look at you look at American football players. You know, anyone anyone on the offensive or defensive line. You know, you got to be at least six foot two really to make it. Yeah. So I don't think I was I was too short to go anywhere in football. Yeah. Okay. You almost seem like you might. Those guys, been, those guys are huge. <laughs> yeah, you almost seem like you might have been built well for a rugby player, maybe like a front row player in rugby. Did you ever? Did you ever there play you rugby go. or? No, no, I've got nephews. Yeah, two nephews that play now that are really good at it. But I, I didn't. I wasn't introduced to rugby back in the day. I didn't know anything about it. Sure, sure. Um, and it, it, you state in the book that in your early days, um, kind of 
experimenting with powerlifting. Um, you, you wrote your own programs. Just kind of give us a bit of a flavour of these programs and the kind of things that you found worked particularly well for you during this time. Um, you know, how often you trained the kind of progressions and loading patterns that you were programming yourself with. Well, for powerlifting, I, I kept it pretty simple. I didn't do anything weird or, you know, different. I, I pretty much did eight-week cycles. Yeah. And what I would do was would start out with sets of eight, and I and I would, I would, uh, I thought to kept it simple. I would squat once a week and do leg stuff once a week with that, and then I'd bench once a week and I'd deadlift once a week. Yeah. So I'd do the, you know, the squat with all the work one day, bench one day with everything, and deadlift one day, and that's all I did was three days a week powerlifting. Well. Wow. And pretty pretty much stuck to the, you know, in the eight week cycle it was like the reps were like. Five sets. I did five sets normally. Yeah. And so I do like sets. I do like eight, eight, sixes, sixes, five, five, four, four, three, three. Okay. I never did anything anything less than triples. Okay. So you'd save your 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 big singles for competition. Yeah. So yeah. yeah whenever I did my, whenever I did my thousand eight squat. The one where you know my very last competition that I did before I went to the Olympic lifting, I did a nine twenty five for a triple. Yeah, wow. massive. And then I and then yeah and then I then I took a thousand pounds out in the rack and I walked out and I did two like quarter squats yeah. just to fill the weight just to fill the weight and that's all I and that was my last workout that's all I did. Wow. So, yeah, I didn't really push or max out or anything. Yeah. Well, obviously, the, the listeners that we have tend to be more often um, interested in the weightlifting. But just just give them a bit of an idea of you know, your powerlifting career, um, you know exactly what you did within powerlifting, uh, and maybe just a, a couple of interesting or funny stories from your your powerlifting days. Man, um, that's kind of a good question about that <laughs> powerlifting. <laughs> well, I mean, here in the U.S., uh, back when I was powerlifting, it, it was I mean it was popular, but not for the general public at all. Okay. You know, people were not interested. But when I first started lifting, I was going to a gym, and there were a few power lifters, and that's when I kind of got got interested in it. Those guys left after two weeks and went somewhere else, and I didn't know where they went, so I was kind of on my own yeah. at this gym. Well, that gym closed down, and so I went to a fitness center, a regular fitness center, yeah. and, so, and started working out. And... um I remember I put, I, I went to like 700 pounds or something like that, or six. it was like 650 pounds when I was going to do a triple, Yeah. and the bar bent, and I got kicked out of the gym. Yeah. They told me not <laughs> to come back. I ended, up, I ended up, over the first like three years of my power distance career, I got kicked out of like four or five gyms for bending bars. It was yeah. terrible. Well, the, the, bar, the, bars, the bars in those gyms just aren't really designed for it, are they? No, no. it's probably like 500 pound test bars or something. Like yeah. So I guess I was beating them all. Wow. So it was, it was it was kind of a rough start, man. Learned, you know, finding a place to lift. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. So how did you first get introduced to, to weightlifting? I was, I, I had, you know, searching around for gyms. I was still not finding a good gym. And so I found a judo gym. Yeah. A place uh, this gym that did judo, but they also had a, a gym, like a small gym there too, and they had a pair of squat racks and a nice bar and some and some weights and everything. And so they told me I could start training there. So I was powerless training there for powerlifting, and there was a guy there that was training two um, younger people for weightlifting. Yeah. And so I kept I kept watching them doing smashes and clean jerks and everything. And he came over and saw me, and he was like, he saw how deep I was squatting and how explosive I was and that kind of stuff. And he asked me to put a you know a broomstick over my head in a snatch position. And so I put, I did that in a snatch position and squatted down. And he was like, man, you got to weight lift. Yeah. You know. So he kept on talking me into it, and I was like, no, no, no. So I went and watched the national championships, and this was in 96, before the 96 games. <laughs> and uh, so the 
national championships were pretty big that year. So my dad and myself went down and watched it in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I really saw, I just saw how professional it was ran. And, yeah. you know, it was just really legitimate. And I liked how it was so much different than weight, than power lift. And as you know, you just walk up on the platform and it's you in the bar. There's nobody else around. Yeah. And it's up to you to lift it. And so I saw that as something that was pretty cool. So I decided to do my very last weightlifting competition in March of 96 and then switch over and start trying to do the Olympic lifts. That's, I mean, what, that's what made me really want to switch. It's amazing, really, when you think that, that someone like yourself who um, performed so well in, in powerlifting um, at international level um, and you know set the, the world squat record that lasted up until, I think, only towards the end of last year, um, the that that you were training relatively independently in a you know in fitness centers and in um, you know in a, in, a, in a, a gym that was attached to a judo facility. Um, you, know, you weren't training in a you know kind of like West Side Barbell or you know any of these kind of meccas. Um, you didn't you, you you weren't employing the kind of uh, the methods that the gurus espouse. Yet you were still able to set these huge huge records and big numbers yeah I mean I don't I know I know that you know I know the methods of training that probably do help you you know can help you a little bit yeah but I mean I I think it just basically comes down to squatting heavy you know just get your lifts in squat heavy and do it right yeah if you do it right without the 10 ply suits and the mono lifts and all yeah. that kind of junk you know, and you walk out with it, you're going to be stronger. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you, that you never squatted with, with bands and chains and all these kind of tools? No. No, I never did anything like that. I would do... I'm not even, I mean, my squat routine was pretty basic. I did my squat. I worked up, did all my squat work. I'd usually go over and do the leg press some. Yeah. Um, and then I would do a few front squats. Not very many, but I do front squats. Yeah, and those were the basic things I did for my squat. Yeah. I just squatted a bunch. Yeah, did a few front squats and did leg press real heavy. Yeah, that was it. Uh, amazing. So, once again, um, you you show your potential in your first competition with a, a snatch of 150 kilos, a clean and jerk of 180 kilos, and once again, that's a that's an amazing platform to build off. Yeah, I mean. I had only been training a few months, and you know, coming from the from powerlifting to weightlifting, yeah, and and did that first competition, and uh, at that point is when I realized that it was a lot of technique involved because yeah. I tried to I tried to muscle up, you know, my first lift, and and it did and it wasn't it was really ugly, <laughs> and so I was like, you know what, maybe I'll keep my arms straight and I'll rely on this technique I've been getting taught. Yeah. And I did it, and the bar kind of felt weightless. And so I realized that I could do it. You know, up to that point, I was kind of like wondering if I was going to be able to do this or not. But whenever I felt one of the lifts actually go up right, I knew it was possible. Yeah. And, and in 1997, um, you competed at the Silver Dragon competition, um, which sadly no longer takes place. But that, that takes place in the UK and Wales. Um, what, what were your memories of that trip to the UK? Well, that was one of my first, you know, competitions for Olympic weightlifting international. Yeah. And I I know I lifted pretty bad there. The reason I did is I enjoyed the countryside too much. Yeah. I, I, I walked like four castles. I was like, man, these castles are cool. And so I went, I took a couple of guys with me and I was taking these castle tours and all this. By the time it came to lifting, I was tired. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. I was like, oh, man. So I kind of learned a lesson from it. But I had a good time over there. I really liked it. Have you been back to the UK since? No, I haven't. I mean, no? that was my only time. That was my only time to be in the UK. Is, 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 you probably very, it really, if you enjoyed the castles in Wales, you'd, you'd probably really enjoy London with some of the, 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 the historical sites and the palaces and that, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. I want to come over. You know, My wife weird. and I have really been wanting to come over just for vacations. Yeah, it's weird. Some of those but, castles in Wales were actually built by coal mining owners, and they're only a couple of hundred years old, but they loved castles so much, they just put 
all their money into building a castle. And if you come to London, oh, wow. you're going to see buildings that are almost a thousand years old. Wow, that's cool. So come to London. <laughs> come to London. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that sounds fun. So just just jumping on a few years, you know, two thousand, you went to the to the Sydney Olympics. It was your your first Olympics of two. Um, you placed tenth with lifts of one ninety five in the snatch, two twenty five in the clean and jerk for a four twenty total. Just tell us about your your build up to that Olympic Games, uh, your memories of it, and just any once again any good stories that came from there. Yeah, um, you know, my first Olympic Games, I made made the Olympic team. Um, at a comp at, at the Olympic trials, um, it was a pretty. It ended up being a pretty big deal because the USA Today, our big, one of our national big national newspapers, um, had me on the cover of the sports section the day after yeah. making the team. And um, it was right after that I got a call to go do the the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Cool. So I went and did that, and really I started just getting all these calls to go do shows. But I I needed to train too. Yeah. So yeah. I did, you know, I did as many things as I could, and I got to do a bunch of really cool, you know, national shows and all that. But I had to turn down a bunch of stuff to train. Um, my training went really well for it. And down in Sydney, we went, we went quite a bit early, and we trained. I guess we trained like a week. Um, down in Canberra. Yeah. Called Canberra. Yeah. Down, down there. That's where their training center is. Down there, I guess. And we trained there for like a week, and then we ended up going to Sydney and training out. But when it came to time for competitions, you know, I was ready physically and everything. Thought I was ready mentally, but when it came time for the competition, right after I weighed in, I started getting more nervous than I've ever been, and I was looking for a way to get out of there. Wow, I was well. like, I don't know. I got to somehow. I got to get out of here, man. I can't do this. <laughs> I mean, and that's just not like me. I don't know what happened, man. I was freaking out. What What do you think it could have been? Is it just the scale of the event? Because it it was a big, big deal. I think it was just. I think I just put so much pressure on myself. Uh-huh. Yeah. That I want, you know, and I had just been telling everyone I'm going to do well and all this, and just the big pressure of sure. everything, and and. And realizing my whole life was coming down to this few moments I was about to go out for. Yeah. And I, I just kind of started freaking out a little bit. But by the time the competition came around, I, you know, I got my my mind mentally ready and was able to overcome it. But it was tough. It was really tough. Because obviously you, you'd lifted at the World Championships the, the previous year. Um, and did you, was, was the Olympics significantly different for you psychologically? They were they were just way different. Yeah, I I still know. I mean, just the magnitude of it was just so much different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so you, you know, that actually that year, that two thousand year, was an extremely strong year for weightlifting, for especially in the plus one hundred fives. I think that was the year when Razazade uh, sort of really came into his own. But you were up against a lot of very 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 strong dudes. Maybe that that didn't that didn't come out maybe four years or eight years later. So what a year yeah, to start was, your Olympic career! It was yeah, that was a very <laughs> it was an unbelievable year. It was it was deep. It was really a deep class. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, I, you were putting I up numbers. The, I was in the B. Yeah, I was in the B session, and I I fought, I was fighting it out with someone to win the B session. You know, yeah, incredible. And that's 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 how it was going for me. Yeah, from hungry. Yeah, that, that's it, it's amazing to think that you were in the B section. You know, you, you were still snatching kind of one ninety five. It's amazing. You know, cleaning and jerking two twenty five, four twenty totals. I mean, those numbers nowadays, I think, would, would probably place you in the A group. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and, and so you, year, but... you you got you got your head back together, um, and you went on the platform and you did you you performed to a level that you were satisfied with. Well. I got all three snatches. Yeah. So I had a good, had a really good snatch day. Um, or was it? Yeah, yeah, I got all three snatches, and then I, I only got my opening clean and jerk. Um, definitely, you know, of course it wasn't what I wanted. You want to go there and go six for six and get everything, but I ended up breaking. I guess I got three PRs there, though. Wow. I got two snatch PRs and a total. So it, overall, it was a good a good competition for me yeah out of the two lifts yeah. 
which lifts do you prefer? You know, do you prefer the snatch? Do you find it's a more reliable lift? I would have thought with your your build, you're a you look like a clean and jerk machine. Yeah, you know, it really went back and forth. But most of the time that I lifted, I did like the snatch more for some reason. Yeah. So that's what I that's what I felt like I was best at. Um, so I know in the in your book you you say that you struggled with the the rack position in the clean. I did, yeah. Early on, I, I, I studied with. Or I, I had a hard time cleaning, and my hands were popping out. But then I was able to fix that just by moving my hands in a little bit. But it took me a few years to figure it out. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, and just any other interesting or funny stories from from Sydney, or any, any, anything you particularly remember from the village, or anything like that? Oh man. <laughs> I was pretty much, you know, I really didn't get to see a lot, to be honest with you. I was, you know, lifting in the 105 plus, so you got to lift at the end of the whole thing. Yeah. So I didn't get a whole lot of chance to go see anything else or get to do a whole lot of anything fun. Yeah. So to be honest, so I didn't get to do much. So I don't have a bunch of stories except for training and yeah. freaking out. And I mean, what was the, the food, one thing? The food like in the, the one village? Thing I, the one thing I do remember is that at the training hall, and it was maybe a week out from the competition, I was in the training hall. Okay. And Razazadov was in there. Yeah. And I was sitting there doing my training, and I remember looking over at him, and he was doing 220 for power clean jerks. And I thought, <laughs> Crazy. good Lord, I'm screwed. <laughs> that's all I was thinking. I was like, oh, good Lord, this guy's going to kill me. That's, 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 that's the moment you're meant to put a 1,000 pounds on the bar and squat it. Yeah. He'd never yeah. do that. <laughs> uh, I was just looking at him. I think like, there's no way I'm going to intimidate this guy. He's, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to sit over here in my corner. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what, was the, what was the food like in the village? I, I believe you sampled the McDonald's. Well, the food, I mean, they had good food and everything, but it all got kind of old, you yeah. know, that cafeteria food. And to be, you know, it was terrible. It's hard. It's terrible to even say this, but I ate McDonald's yeah. all the time. And I probably gained 15 pounds <laughs> in Sydney. I ate McDonald's every meal for breakfast and lunch, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Okay, so what uh, McDonald's What McDonald's sandwich would you go for? What's the, the Hammond Olympic sandwich? Is it a Big yeah, Mac? I was eating, well, for breakfast, I was eating the, I was eating the Egg McMuffins. I'd eat, like, two or three of them. Yeah, I, I know for, how many calories are in them. That's, I think they're about <laughs> 400 calories each. <laughs> I know. I go to work and, and there's a McDonald's too close to work, so I think, oh, I'll get some breakfast. <laughs> oh man, it's bad. Oh, Christ. And then they had of course they had they had double cheeseburgers and Big Macs oh, yeah. there and I would just grab like a couple of each of them and eat those for lunch and stuff. It was terrible. Brilliant. <laughs> um did, did you never did you never try and get sponsorship from McDonald's? Did I try any what? Did you did you ever try and get sponsorship from McDonald's? Sponsorship? Yeah. From, from, no, from, no, from McDonald's. No, 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 I never did. No. Uh, <laughs> you, you think that, that would have been a good idea. Yeah. You probably thought after Powered the Olympics. By McDonald's. You probably thought after the Olympics they'd given you enough. <laughs> Get out of big room on my. Well, we we interviewed um, a, a British lifter uh, uh, last week, a guy called David Morgan, who who placed fourth at Olympics twice, very and, and won won five Commonwealth Games, and he was saying that he went to his first Commonwealth Games, um, and he he wanted to get get sponsorship, and the only company he could think of was a a company over over in the UK that make um, kind of a condensed milk, it's a a condensed milk drink. And this was in the okay. in in the early in the early nineteen eighties. Um, company called Carnation, and so he he would drink this Carnation. It was called Build Up. I guess it was like a very early forerunner of a of a protein shake, I suppose. Um, and so when he got back from the Commonwealth Games, having won it um, as the youngest person ever to win the Commonwealth, he said he wrote to this company for and asked them and said, you know, I've just won the Commonwealth Games. I'm the youngest ever Commonwealth Games champion. Um, would you, you know, and I, I drank your product the whole way through my my training. Would you consider sponsoring me? And they turned around. They wrote him a letter back and said, "Thank you for writing to us, um, but we don't actually sponsor people. But here is five pence off of your next purchase. A, a coupon for five pence off of your next purchase." <laughs> that's it. That was it. Yeah, five pence off. That's oh, what, that's, that's, that's what that's what you get for winning a Commonwealth Games. 
But that's that, ridiculous. <laughs> that screams Great oh, Britain, man. though. Yeah, that's that's Britain for you. <laughs> um, in, in 2001, obviously, sadly, the the US team um, would would miss out on on going to to, to Turkey because of the the 9/11 attacks and safety concerns. It's so obviously a, yeah. a, a very sobering time for for the whole world. But just just tell us how how you and, and the other guys felt about not being able to go and compete in that championship. Well, I mean, we were all ready to go and everything, and so it was. You know, when that you know when nine one one happened or when nine eleven happened, it was it was tough on us because we were training so so well trained up, and I, you know I was in the shape of my life at that point, and. I don't know. It was just a really a down thing, but we all understood why. Yeah, uh, we understood why we couldn't go, and so no one really griped much about mm-hmm. it. We were just, we just, we just did what they told us to do, and they let us. You know, we just got the list at the American Open, and with our best there and everything. So yeah, we, got, we had to get like our world championships. So it was it was definitely a tough year. How do you how do you feel you you could have done and and perhaps may, where you may have placed if you had have gone to Turkey that year? I mean, I really think I would have been top five. Yeah, I was just, I mean, because my lifts, I was probably when my lifts were the strongest for some reason. I was just really strong at that point. Do you yeah. remember what you did in at the two thousand one, two thousand two, right time? Do you remember what you did in the in the Americans? What sort of weights you lifted um, in two thousand one? I don't remember, but I remember I held back a little bit because I was like, I'm not at the World Championship, so I'm not going to yeah. push so hard that I hurt myself. Sure. Yeah. You know, but I did hold back. And you, you also discuss a very interesting trip to Russia in 2002 in the, in the book. Just tell, tell the listeners a bit about that trip. Well, we went to a, a competition up in Salakard, Russia, up in the Arctic Circle. Yeah. And... That was it was it was pretty cool, man. And uh, overall, the the competition was cool. It was just a a really rough trip. And the day before, we stayed in Moscow at the training center, and it was just a horrible experience overall. Yeah, uh, just you know, just really rough. I didn't sleep at all that night. Flew to flew to Solicard, and I didn't. I wasn't able to sleep that night either. I don't know. It was just really weird. But I had a really good, really good competition there. I think I snatched 195, and I don't remember exactly, but I think I snatched 195, clean just like 225, something yeah. in that range, yeah. 230. But it was a good, really good competition, and I ended up getting, I beat out, I beat, here's, here was my highlight of the whole thing, I beat Ronnie Veller. Yeah, cool. In that competition, I finished above him, so I thought I was pretty cool then. Yeah. <laughs> and do you, do, you yeah. Rem- do you remember who the two lifters were that beat you in that competition? No. Uh, hold on, was it? I think Chimurkin. Yeah, brilliant. I think it was. I think it was Chimurkin, and then I don't remember who the other guy was. Okay. I can't, I can't remember. Chimurkin was probably the only guy there that that made you look small. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, he's big. He is a big dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I believe you. What you won was it a couple of thousand bucks in that competition. Um, yeah. And it was was it confiscated by the uh, the Russian um, customs? Yes. When I was trying to leave the country, they kept telling me, they found it in my bag and they told me I was a drug dealer. And I showed them my trophy. Yeah. From winning, I said I won a competition. This is my prize money. And they said I was a drug dealer. They took you know they were all these guys were point you know poking me with guns. I mean it was a nightmare. And they said I had to give them their mo- my, that money before I left, and so yeah, I had to give the money up. I was it was just <laughs> it was just overall a really bad experience going to Russia. I didn't like it. Do you think that being American, they that they treated you intentionally poorly, or do you think that was just the the kind of status quo for anyone that would have been there? It's hard to say. You know, yeah. really, it's hard to say. It's, I mean. I just know I got treated bad. That's all I know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it was because I was American or not. <laughs> now, also, it probably two- didn't help. Probably didn't help anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> also, in two thousand and two, you had your best ever showing in terms of placing at a world championship. You snatched one hundred and ninety-seven and a half, which I believe is still the the current American record in the snatch. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a two twenty-seven and a half clean and jerk for a four twenty-five total. You, you placed fifth. Um, 
must have been a very proud you know, moment for you in your career. Um, interestingly, at the the year later at the World Championships, it, it could have easily gone the other way. Um, you actually missed your first two clean and jerks. Um, and of course, the thing that was riding on that was that you had to basically get a clean and jerk to qualify three li- three American lifters for the subsequent year's Olympics. So you've you, you, you know, in a sense, you're you've had a great competition the year before. You're now in a position where you have to make your final clean and jerk. Otherwise, there's no American males going to the to the Olympics. What what's going through your mind at that moment? Well, it was. I had a really bad warm up back there in 2002 for the clean jerk, and uh, I mean I blew it one of my 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 singlet ribs. I mean everything was going wrong. Yeah, back there everything went wrong, and I was just getting rushed. And all of a sudden they called me. I did my last warm up, and they said you're up, you're up, you're out. And so I had to run down this long hall, run out there because time was ticking. And I grabbed the bar, cleaned it, and I stood up and. It cut my, you know, I hit that artery. Yeah. And so I was passing out, and I tried to jerk it anyway. Yeah. So that's what happened on the first one. Couldn't get it. And so then I had the two-minute clock try to recover. Um, I felt like I got recovered pretty good. I came back out. I cleaned it again, and again, I started passing out and tried to jerk again. Yeah. Couldn't get it. So it was that's what happened on the first two. It just... Yeah, I mean, I was passing out on them. And so the third one, I knew it came down to that. You know, yeah. I knew, and my coach told me, so we do this or we don't have an Olympic team. And so yeah, no pressure. It, was just, it was the biggest, <laughs> if, you, if you watch it on video, that's the biggest gut out lift you'll ever see. Yeah. I mean, everything was just ugly and whatever, but I was just fighting for it, man. <laughs> Incredible, really, and, and and I guess you, obviously you're fighting for your the places for your country at the, at the Olympics, but realistically, you also knew you were fighting for your own place. At the, exactly at the yeah. Olympics. I pretty much knew if I got that, I got that. You know, three people would go, and I'd still be, you know, I'd be high enough that I would, you know, be one of them going. Yeah, you know, and I knew nobody would be able to pass me. So it was, it was me fighting for my for my Olympic life right there too. So it was, I remember after that competition, I went out to eat with my family. I had a lot of family come come to watch me. And uh, when we were eating, I couldn't even really talk. I was just sitting there kind of numb. Yeah. But I was just, I was just drained, man. It was horrible. It was stress and everything. Did you, so did, it was, it was tough. Is, is that an experience that you, that you've, you commonly feel after competitions? I know for myself when I, when I've competed and, and, and people that I coach give me similar feedback. Um, they, you know, we, we all kind of have a sense of, you know, for a couple of days after you feel like you've been run over by a bus, but then even for the for the week or two after you feel somewhat deflated. Is that something you experience regularly or not so much? You know, I definitely experienced it more with powerlifting really? physically. Okay. Like when I was powerlifting, I would physically feel worn out, but, but with weightlifting more mentally. Yeah. But, okay. but yeah, yeah, it is something because, you know, you're building up to that and then all the pressure you know, hitting the right lifts in the right moments and the build up and then it's done. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think that's probably a very normal thing for everyone. Yeah. I would think. So you, so you get that place, you, you get these three places, one of which ends up being yours. And in the 2004 Olympics in Athens, you perform particularly well, I guess, in terms of placing and in terms of your clean and jerk, you, you place seventh. Uh, you clean and jerk two thirty seven and a half, which I believe once again uh, is the American record that still stands today for a four thirty total, which is also an American record. Once again, just tell us a bit about the build up to that Olympics, um, a bit about Athens itself and the experience there, because obviously weightlifting is quite a culturally relevant sport in in Greece. Um, tell us a bit about the competition um, and, and and how you felt about that performance. Yeah, it was. It was a really good build up and training for that competition. And uh I, I went in there with really big expectations. I mean, I knew physically my body could be two oh five, two forty five. Yeah. And that was what I was hope that was what I was planning and hoping on doing. I mean that's that's the numbers I had written on my wall in my room and everything. Yeah. You know, that's what I was trying to do was trying to total four fifty. Yeah. So, um when I came out though, 
I mean, whole build up was cool. It was a great, great experience getting over there, you know, being part of Team USA and the whole Olympic experience was good. The training hall was, you know, it was a good training hall, good food, all that. Um, but when it came time to the competition and the snatch, I usually get really psyched up inside. Yeah. You know, I have the feeling when I'm walking out there, I know I'm going to hit this lift, you yeah. know, and there's no doubt about it. And and that's the feeling that I need to be able to lift well. Well, when it was when I was lifting this time in the snatch, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get that feeling at all. I was really just numb. It was, and it was something that I wasn't used to because I'm usually get psyched up pretty easily. Yeah. And so I, I snatched my 190 kilo opener. Or was it 192.5? Oh, shoot, I don't even, yeah, it was 192.5 opener. Yeah. And I got it, and it felt pretty heavy. And so then I just, I mean, I wasn't even really close with my next two. They just didn't even feel like they were in place or anything. So at least I got my opener. But on the clean jerk, when I started getting ready for a clean jerk, I started feeling a little bit better. Yeah. And started feeling a little more psyched. And so I was able to pull off that 237.5 on my second attempt. And then I went for 242.5 on my third. And uh, when I started pulling it, it was just out front a little bit. Yeah. And I just I basically did a high pull. Yeah. But I, I knew it was out of place, and I knew I really wasn't going to be able to jump under it. Sure. So I was overall really, really disappointed with that competition, even though I hit, you know, my best clean jerk and best total ever. I was still very disappointed with everything because okay. if I would have been able to hit my numbers, I could have been fighting for a bronze, you know. Yeah. So, what was your best? So, what were your best lifts in training? My best lifts in training were one ninety. Hold on. No, I did one ninety. Yeah, one ninety. But I did it like three different times. Okay. But I never, I never really maxed out in okay. the Olympic lifts either. So 190 and then 230 clean and jerk. Those were my two highest wow. I went in, in training. Yeah. So and then I just go real heavy on my pulls and all that. Okay. So so pushing for those big numbers was a, you know, it wasn't the norm for you when you go out to cut these competitions. You were sort of almost stepping into the unknown a little bit. Yeah. I I pretty much I normally open with around what I what my best list was in the gym. Okay. And then I would go from there. Yeah. Because I knew, usually I would know if I did it in the gym, I'd have anywhere from five to 10 kilos more. Yeah. In the competition. And that's just how I was. Wow. Now, you, you obviously, you, you lived at the Olympic Training Center for five years um, under, you were coached by a drug Um Now, obviously, that was very different to, I guess, when, you, when you'd been in, um, you know, the, the judo gym and you'd been coaching yourself largely and so on, to have that, that much more, I guess, more structured approach to training someone else, um, dictating what you would be doing on a daily basis. What do you feel um, coming from from Coach Dragomir worked particularly well for you? Um, and and you know what what philosophically did did his, his how did his, his approach philosophically differ from the kind of training you'd been doing before when you were a bit more self coached, perhaps. Um, one thing Dragomir brought was experience. Yeah. And and just his knowledge of of international competition and getting ready. So more than even more than him even being a good gym coach, he was just the best competition coach ever. Yeah. I mean he he had a way of feeling everything Dragomir could feel what you were feeling. I mean he was in your mind. And he'd feel everything that you're feeling. I mean, it was a real, I mean, he was, a, it was unbelievable how he was able to coach your competition. So he could get you, just get you ready, you know, to get out there and lift. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, he was, yeah, he was a good gym coach, had a great eye. Yeah. You know, if you missed the lift, he could tell you what you did wrong and everything. But, I mean, as far as where he stood out was at, at competitions. Okay. And of course, yeah, I mean, just, you know, since since this period, I mean, you've you've done a number of different things to to uh, you know to, to keep the wolf from the door to earn some money, um, and and one of those being obviously doing some coaching yourself and and, and training people, uh, I guess in, in mainly in strength type stuff. 
Um, when you when you're writing programs and coaching um, kind of intermediate level gen- genetically relatively average people in strength training and in the Olympic lifts, what kind of programming approach do you um, do you prescribe? Um, I prescribe a lot of a lot like what what we did with Dragomir. Okay, just I mean a lot of people can't train that much. Most people that I've trained or train can work out like three days a week. Yeah. So just in that volume, I mean, it's not going to, nothing I do is going to be spectacular because anybody I train doesn't, isn't able to be a full-time trainer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, an athlete. So I am working on starting a program. I'm only here with my job now. I work week on week off. Yeah. And I'm out of town one week. I'm home the next week. So I can't do anything very regular, but I've got a couple other guys that are coaching, and we're actually starting a weightlifting program now okay. here in Tulsa. And so I'm going to be able to start using that experience a little more than I have in the past. So I'm I'm pretty excited about hopefully do you, you do know, you, finding out. Do you have a website? About how I'm going to coach. Do you have a website yet, or anything of that nature for that that program? For that program, we're just starting it, but it's a it's at a CrossFit. Okay. And it's called Oki Oki CrossFit, so O K I E, so it's Oki CrossFit. Okay. And that's where we're. That's where I'm starting a program with, and that's who I'm teaming up with. Yeah. And so it's just in the beginning stages. And, and are, are you a, a believer in, in mainly focusing on the the, the lifts themselves? Yeah. You, know, you mentioned there that you used pulls as well. Um, what's your kind of philosophy on on how much time you should spend with the classic lifts? How much time you should spend? with assistance work and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm, I, th- I think definitely when someone starts, they need to spend tons of time working on technique and then get their strength in with the pulls and squats. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the key. And then once their lifts get better, they can start training their lifts, you know, a lot harder. But yeah. the base, of course, the base is coming from back squat, front squat, and pulls. Yeah. That's where everything's coming from. And as long as they're doing those and working on technique, they're going to be getting better. And, and, and just kind of in short, when, you, when you're you know, for yourself or, or when you're programming for someone else. And um, when you're programming the snatch or the clean and jerk, um, you know, h- how are you How are you looking at it? Are you kind of looking at, you know, triples, X amount of weeks away from competition and then moving into doubles, then moving into singles? You know, what, what kind of percentage ranges are you looking at at different times? Just, just you know, briefly. Kind of for example, I would say, you know, if it's a 10-week cycle, yeah. they're going to be doing triples and doubles the first six weeks yeah you know mainly just triples and doubles and then the last four weeks they're going to be doing mainly doubles and singles yeah that's the way that's kind of how i'd program it and just progressively getting heavier with the pulls during that whole 10 week cycle and do you would you build in lighter days and heavier days for the for the snatch and clean and jerk do what now so would you, would you build in maybe a lighter day in the week for a snatch and a heavier day, and and same for the clean and jerk? Yeah, I mean if you're if they're only training three days a week, there's going to be, I would say a you know one snatch day, yeah, where you work on everything snatch, one clean and jerk day, and then one where you do both. Yeah, that's how that's how I would program it. If they're doing five, then yeah, you're going to have a heavy snatch day, a light clean and jerk day, a heavy clean and jerk day, a light clean and jerk day or light snatch day and then both on Friday or whatever. Yeah, okay. On the fifth day. Yeah, so. So at the minute. I mean, yeah, I think you can train heavy if you're only doing three days a week. You can train heavy all the time, but if you're doing five like we were at the training center, you got to have a couple of lighter days. Yeah. So at the minute, are you getting any chance to, to keep, you know, active in, in lifting? Are you, are you doing any any training yourself? Um, I mean, I'm training still, but I don't do anything heavy. I'll tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with I'm done with anything heavy. Yeah. Do you get down to the driving yeah. range much? Uh, I I do that more than I more than I lift heavy. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but I yeah I still stay involved. I still cool. You know I still do lifts, but they're definitely lighter. Yeah. Just keep stuff moving and uh, yeah. I mean, competing is definitely over for me. Sure. Just, just just before we, we, we bring things to a conclusion, I just wanted to just, just to ask you one question um, on, obviously, the, 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 in a sense, the man that came before you in super heavyweight weightlifting in the States was, was Mark Henry. Um, yes. And, you know, in, in, in a sense, you both had kind of a similar 
similar backgrounds. Both of you started off in powerlifting. Both of you went into weightlifting. Um, did you, I mean, did, so comparisons can, can be drawn. Um, which of you do you feel is the strongest American in the last, you know, 50 years? Um, uh, do you think it's, well, you, hopefully you're going to say yourself. Um, what, 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 are, what are your feelings on that comparison? And is there anyone else that you, you put up there as being, you know, the, the, one of the strongest Americans, perhaps? Well, I mean, I hate to even comment on that because I think, you know, with all the with the strongman competitions and powerlifting and weightlifting, with all the different things. Yeah. I mean, I, I just I just can't say that anybody is the strongest guy in America. I wouldn't I wouldn't claim anybody. Yeah. I would say, hey, that guy's the strongest strongman that's ever you know that's competed in the last fifty years. Yeah. I definitely say I'm the strongest weightlifter in this country. Yeah. You know, I've become the best weightlifter that this country's had. Um, there's other guys that are the strongest powerlifters. So it's just it's just hard for me. I wouldn't I would never claim to be the strongest man. I, I you know because there's so many different disciplines. But I've definitely lifted more than anybody else for the Olympic lifts, and that's what matters to me. Yeah, sure. Um, so just before we say it, before we tie up, any any kind of. Uh plugs that you wanted to get in anything you would like to you know get out there so our, our listeners could go and have a look perhaps a website um you know, obviously we mentioned the, the book so you may want to just briefly mention that um and just any kind of any charities you were involved in any movements that you that you were involved in um and just any general messages that you had for for, for, the, for the listeners and your your fans well i mean i'm definitely on anyone can find me my website is shanehammond.com also i'm on facebook you know, you look me up on Facebook and yep. I have tons of friends overseas on Facebook and that's how I talk to a lot of people. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I love, I love listening sports and everyone out there that's listening to this, you know, especially over there in the UK and everything, you guys just stay strong, stay drug free, do it right, you know, and you'll be happy later, you know. Yeah. So many people try to cheat their way to the top whether it's powerlifting, using a million suits, you know, or, you know, doing things, cutting squats, things like that. I yeah. just say just do it right, do everything right, and in the end you're going to be happier with yourself. And, uh, yeah, I just want to say good luck to everybody that's competing, and I sure hope you all achieve your dreams, for sure. Great, thank you very much, Shane. The, the, the book, obviously, is available on your website to purchase. It uh, is. I believe and it's yeah, obviously yeah. available on, on Amazon and similar outlets. Um, yeah, you can get it on Amazon too. So get hold of a copy of that. It's a very, it, it's not a particularly long book, is it? It's quite an easy read. Um, so I've, I've read it, yeah. a, read it a couple. Of, did you write it yourself? Or was there a ghostwriter I, involved? I actually did write it myself. Yeah. So pen. That's why it's not very long. From your own That's hand. <laughs> <laughs> from your own hand. Um, but listen, Shane, thank you so much for giving us this time today. We, we really do appreciate it. Um, How you bet. And, uh, you know, best of luck with everything you're doing, and maybe we'll catch up with you again down the line. That sounds like a plan. I appreciate you guys. Thank Great. you for calling. And make sure you come to London. Come to London and look us up. All right, I will. I'll do that. Good Great. Night. Take care, Shane. Thanks, thank, you. Shane. thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.